Hi, David. How you doing? Hi, Josh. Just fine. Good to see you again. Um, we met last year, at the end of the year in December, we did a dialogue on Buddhism and biology, um, talking about the convergence between the two. Um, and to introduce you, I'll say that you are David Barash, uh, evolutionary biologist and professor emeritus of psychology at University of Washington. I'm Josh Summers, and this is Meaning of Life TV. And I wanted to have you back um, for another conversation to focus more on your intellectual trifecta of existential Buddhist biology. We got into it a little bit at the end of our last conversation, but I don't feel like we, we did it justice. Um, and I think there's a lot of uh, meat on those bones to, to unpack and explore. Um, well, so I appreciate hearing that. Yeah, no, I, I, it's, it's, it's kind of a unique spin. And I think there's, there's um, things to tease out that uh, each of them on their own don't really get into, obviously. Um, you wrote in the, at the end of the book, you said, biology tells us about what the world is, uh, or about the world as it is, essentially nothing about what we ought to do. Existentialism tells us about what we ought to do, essentially nothing about the world as it is. And Buddhism tells us a fair amount about both. Put them all together and we get an intellectual trifecta that tells us quite a lot about everything. So <laughs> uh, that's kind of it in a nutshell. And... Um, there seems to be something both descriptive and prescriptive about this this fusion that you've formulated. Um, so maybe as a way to start, I'd just be curious to hear from you about what led you to formulate this trifecta. Well, I guess to be honest, um, a good part of it is really idiosyncratic. In, in my own case, I've had an interest in biology and professional interest in biology for, literally for decades, similarly for Buddhism, similarly for existentialism. Um, and it's only within the last maybe five or six years that I became aware that these are not really necessarily independent, that there is some reasonable connection between them. And I, I would add, you know, it's not necessarily true that any random phenomena can be combined in a meaningful way, uh, you know, like hemorrhoids and happiness, or, you know, uh, Trump, Trump and truthfulness. Right. <laughs> you know, some things don't work together very well. But I think in this case, the three do, existentialism, biology, and Buddhism, in, in ways that, to my knowledge, really have not been identified before. Um, at the same time, I think it's important to note really at the outset that there are areas of uh, disconnect as well. And um, I'm not claiming that all three fit together like hand in, or th three hands and three gloves or however the metaphor would work. Uh, but, but I think they really do speak to each other in ways that are, are interesting and revealing. Right. It, I mean, it, it seems like the way you use it, they kind of constrain each other a little bit or they uh, shave down each other or, or limit, limit each field a little bit to, um, to fit into that square, square in a way. Um, or maybe one could call it a triangle. With a triangulation, right. They fit, fit them in the triangle, right. And uh, there's a fair amount of overlap. But again, the overlap is not identical. And I think that's a good point that you just made, which is that they, they limit each other in ways that are, I think, also meaningful. If you take any one alone, I think one has a fairly limited worldview. But if you put them together, I'm not sure. I think I may have been overly optimistic when I said it explains everything, but I think it explains a fair amount. So what is what do you see getting described by this this particular triangulated lens? Like in terms of like in terms of experience of life and and the implications around the meaning for life. Sure. Well certainly one of the most well documented frequent questions that people ask in any culture really is what is the meaning of life we, we hear this over and over it becomes a uh, almost a joke on the other hand there are lots of cartoons about that um, and yet it is a real question that many people ask um, and I think this is an area let's uh, we can start well we could start with biology um, to, as far as I'm concerned biology tells us really pretty clearly that there is no meaning to life. Um, the, 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 there's no inherent meaning to life. By virtue of being alive, 
neither you nor I nor uh, a bumblebee nor a giraffe has an inherent meaning. And the, 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 the metaphor I like to use actually comes from Douglas Adams' wonderful science fiction novel uh, um, in which um, there, we, we meet the, the whale of Magrathea. And, um, just to speed this along, essentially our heroes are in a spaceship and they're approaching the planet Magrathea and they've apparently automatically triggered a, um, a nuclear or really two nuclear missiles that are fired at their spaceship um, and it looks like everything is lost, there's no hope. And so they push this marvelous red button. Oh, by the way, this is called the, the Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. I right. forgot to mention that. They press your button. The button is labeled the infinite improbability generator. And you're not supposed to press it because when you do, infinite, things of infinite improbability will happen. Well, what happens is that at least one of those, one of those nuclear missiles is turned into a pot of petunias. And we can sort of forget about that one for the time being. The other one is turned into a, a baby sperm whale who's suddenly been generated out of infinite improbability. And it is a couple thousand feet above the planet. And it looks around and it's very engaging. You, we hear its internal dialogue. And it says, why am I here? What is my purpose in life? And then it says, what is this thing getting closer and closer to me or getting larger and larger? M I think I'll call it ground. Maybe it will be my friend. And, and that's the last we hear of the poor whale of Magrathy until later when our heroes are walking around on the planet, they encounter various chunks of uh, whale blubber. Um, the reason for my going into this story is not simply that it's a bit grotesque and comical, but I think to a large extent when people ask that question, why am I here? What is my purpose in life? I think they're unintentionally repeating the rather comical monologue of the whale of Magrathea. We are all produced by a, essentially, an, if not an infinite improbability generator, at least a generator of substantial improbability, namely genetics. When our father's sperm, one particular sperm, met one particular egg from our mother, there we were. Mm -hmm. And we had all sorts of experiences from then on. To assume that we were produced, anyone is produced with a purpose, is every bit as absurd in my mind, and I think biologically that argument is supported, every bit as absurd as, as the, the poor whale of Magrathea. So if we simply look at biology alone, I think we are constrained to conclude that life in itself has no meaning. So that's the, that's the biological take on the meaning of life. And, and meaning and purpose are, in your, in your view, synonymous. I would consider them essentially synonymous, right? right? For those people who say, who look for a purpose in their life outside of themselves, as though there is an extrinsic purpose for which they have been produced, uh, which is equivalent, really. It's not exactly, but it's very close to the question, what is the meaning of my life? The meaning is to find your purpose. Well, what is the purpose? Uh, but, and this is where I think the existentialists but on the on the on the, beauty, on the biological side, would you would you agree that there, that that life the life purpose is just to project replications of genes into the next generation? Right. Actually, and I'm I'm glad you you halted me on that. Absolutely, and I do write about that for sure. That biologically speaking, the only purpose of living things is really to promote their genes. That we are essentially genetic catapults. Right only purpose is to, pro to project these genes into the future. Now, one can say, yes, that's a purpose, but it's certainly not the kind of purpose that makes one's heart sing. Mm -hmm. um, and especially in an overcrowded world um, and under-resourced, um, uh, if anything, that's a purpose that many of us should take with a grain of salt. Um, it's not an ethical purpose. It's simply a mechanical purpose. Mm -hmm. In the and same it, sense that the purpose of an engine is to make the car run. You know? Right, 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 right. Um, and, and that mechanical purpose has endowed this species with, all, and not just our species, but all spe a lot of species, with lots of impulses, drives, um, certain behavioral traits to effectively catapult those genes into the next generation and Buddhism seems to be 
uh, in a large part, of resisting those impulses, or for a, a system of, of sort of recognizing and then either stepping out of or transcending those impulses. Um, do you see that? Um, what's the question here? Um, do you? Do, I mean, do you do take that position that that Buddhism, in a way, is going against our evolutionary uh, the evolutionary force within us? Yes, I think it is. I think it is. And um, insofar as that's true, I think that's one of the strengths of Buddhism, frankly. Mm -hmm. it, it is not, and I think a further strength is what it doesn't do. Because one can argue that many things in fundamentalist Abrahamic religions, um, by which I mean J Judaism, Christianity, and, and Islam, tend often to be very prescriptive and proscriptive to a degree that uh, I find particularly unpleasant. Buddhism is, doesn't go that far. Um, it doesn't prescribe, at least the, the Buddhism to which I adhere. Right. And there are various, uh, obviously we know that there are many different versions and flavors of Buddhism, but the Buddhism to which I adhere does not talk about the fires of hell and about, about severe punishments, although the whole business about if you misbehave, you may find yourself reincarnated uh, as a cockroach is something that I find not just uh, um, uh, unbelievable but unpleasant. <laughs> so. <laughs> right, so when we talk about these things, we should be, particularly when we get into the existentialism and Buddhism, we should be, I'd like us to clarify what, a, what version of Buddhism and what version of existentialism, or for, what form of these things you're actually referring to. Um, be, because yeah, the, the, regard... the, these things, both of them are, can be pretty broad. Um, sure, well with regard to Buddhism, I'm particularly influenced by the version that's been espoused in, in, in increasingly in the West by, by Thich Nhat Hanh, the, the Vietnamese monk and his order of interbeing, where he has a number of precepts, um, many of which do involve restraining what might otherwise be our natural inclinations, um, be it essentially honesty without going into the details of each of these, but essentially if we're inclined to lie or if we feel like we want to do that, we might want to have, have a second thought. If we're inclined to behave in a way that's um, selfish and self-aggrandizing at the expense of others, um, we should stop and think mindfully um, in terms of we should, if at all possible, establish mindful ways of living, uh, of speech, uh, etc. Um, so that approach, what, what Thich Nhat Hanh calls the order of interbeing, um, is one that I, I feel particularly admiring of. Um, and it recognizes the interpenetration, the interconnection of all living things, uh, which is highly ecologically relevant as well as evolutionarily and, and ethically. Um, mm -hmm. Now, the, the existentialists have an interest, I'm sorry. I no, I was going to say, yeah, so, so what, what, is, what does existentialism bring to the, the Buddhist perspective? What does um, Buddhist, Buddhism bring to the existentialist perspective here? Yeah, well, the, the existentialist perspective, maybe we should go back a little bit to the biological perspective, but just to touch on it briefly. If the biological perspective, which and I, I believe this quite strongly, maintains that we have no inherent purpose other than our genes promoting themselves. Um, existentialism agrees with that. Existen the, the existentialists, in fact, feel very strongly and argue quite strongly. Um, whether it's the atheist or the, or the, um, the Christian version of existentialism, whether it comes out of uh, a Nietzschean tradition or a Kierkegaardian tradition, that we really do not have any essence. And indeed, Jean-Paul Sartre, famously wrote uh, that existence precedes essence, meaning we are, there we are. We don't have any pre-existing self, in that sense, not unlike the Buddhists. Um, our nature is a mirage, and in that sense, not unlike the Buddhists. A mirage, in, if people believe, if you think that somehow it exists independent of how you actually live your life. And so for the existentialist, existence precedes essence. What you do is what defines who you are. Mm. And so your, your essence doesn't exist until you behave. And once you behave, you've established that essence. And so with regard to the question of life's meaning or life's purpose, um, the argument here, at least as I see it, is that in a universe that is unimaginably large, 
and that really doesn't care about us, um, and that has not pre-programmed us to do a particular thing other than as the biologist would say, to promote one's own genes, right. then it's up to us. If we want to have a life of meaning and of purpose, it's up to us then to do it, to establish it, to, to, to establish that purpose by virtue of how we live. And here again, there's um, some interesting parallelisms, particularly with Buddhism, and somewhat in contradiction addiction to biology, which we can get to as well, which is that the existentialists emphasize very strongly the notion of choice and the notion of freedom. And in order for us to define ourselves by what we do, we have to be free to do it. And Sartre came up with this marvelous self-contradictory, seemingly contradictory phrase that we are condemned to be free, yeah. Which is a wonderful thing to meditate on, by the way. Um, we have to make our own choices. And within Buddhism as well, there's a very strong influence, uh, emphasis on choosing one's path and doing so mindfully. Right. And actually, so I had written some of that, some notes around that down. I wanted to ask you about that. Uh, what, is, what is freedom from an existentialist perspective? And what does freedom within a Buddhist view look like under the, under the guise of existentialism? Well, the two are not the same, and it's, very, it's a very appropriate question to raise. This would be one example where uh, there is a, some degree of discordance. There's basic adherence to the idea of freedom, but if you drill down, there are some real problems. Um, Pro, not I, I, maybe I shouldn't say real problem, but there are some areas of of, uh, of non overlap. Put it that way. Uh, for for the existentialists, freedom is almost absolute and complete. Um, Simone de Beauvoir, Sartre's lover, and and uh, some say uh, his his muse, and maybe even uh, superior thinker, mm -hmm. um, wrote that human beings are lettre dans lettre et de n'être pas, which is the being whose being is to have no being. So we have no inherent being. We can do whatever we want, not literally physically. Obviously, we can be constrained and restrained, but our minds are free. And we can – what we do has a profound – we have a profound responsibility for how we act and what we do uh, because we are completely free. Radical freedom, essentially, is another way of looking at the existential view. Now, from the Buddhist perspective – Freedom is very important. Free will and choice certainly is important. But for most Buddhists, there is a substantial constraint, which is this basic notion of karma. Um, we are, to a large extent, and often to an extent that we don't realize, constrained not by our own intentionality or failure of intentionality, but by what happened to us in an earlier incarnation, by what our previous um, bodies or souls did and that influences how we are literally the body in which we find ourselves and how we are going to behave and that's an area where I um, uh, I no longer adhere to the Buddhist perspective yeah that kind of um, we want to call it traditional Buddhist or religious Buddhist perspective where there's the sort of a metaphysics of reincarnation and all that but I think there's also a compelling, and there, I, there's a broader interpretation coming now, more of a secular uh, reimagining or potentially even just uncovering of what the original Buddhist teachings were that wasn't so much about reincarnation so much as um, looking at the conditionality of experience and how past conditionality or past conditions and contingencies influence current current experiences, and you know you could take out the the past life stuff and still have a kind of argument for the condition the contingency of choice. Absolutely, yes, and and actually the the Dalai Lama as well was very clear when he was asked to define karma in in just a few words. He said it's the law of cause and effect. It's simply things that happen happen for a reason and things that we do happen at least in part because of things that we did previously. Everything counts <laughs> would be another way of looking at it. Right. Um, 
And I, I absolutely agree. One does not have to swallow the entire uh, dogma, which is what I consider a reincarnation, in order to sign on to that. And indeed, here's an area where biology comes in in a way that's actually very convivial. Because from the biological perspective, we, we do have the equivalent of karma of sorts influencing us. Um, not only cause and effect in our own behavior, what we do, what we think, how we feel is a function of what happened to us not just a few seconds ago, an hour ago, yesterday, uh, or years ago, but also in fact what happened to our ancestors because that determined which genes got promoted into the future and ultimately wound up inside us. So in that literal sense, we are the consequences of, we are the karmic, if you want, you could say we are the karmic, put in parentheses, genetic, consequences of what our ancestors did. Right. Um, so in, in the existential sense, though, you're suggesting that they, some of them at least, felt that there was this absolute freedom or absolute ability to choose. Right. That there Absolutely. Were, um, one of the phrases that came, I was when, as I was reading through stuff, uh, I was thinking about this. That um, seems like not uh, not all choosers are equal, or not all choosers are created equal. Whether it's um, due to life circumstances or just something irritating that happened in the morning that might affect your your decision making process in the afternoon, or more more malignant things like tumors and. Um, uh, whatever that that would cause you to be an impaired chooser or to put a more serious constraint on on choice, um, and I was, what do you think of that? I mean, what what I guess the question I'm trying to come to is, what kind of agent is operating within this choice process? That's re, that's in a way re, you know requisite in order to. Uh, create the meaning for life that, that you're describing? Well, once again, I think you put your finger on the downside of a kind of fundamentalism. Um, for a kind of radical existentialist perspective, there is, in fact, radical freedom of choice uh, or a fundamentalist view. I don't believe that that really does exist, even for those of us who are so fortunate as to at least perceive that we have a great deal of choice. On the other hand, if you're born into profound, grinding poverty, uh, the, the, your, your options obviously are substantially diminished. I mean, mm -hmm. take it further yet. If you're uh, in, in prison and chained to a wall, your physical options, your options, what you can do with your body is very limited. Although Sartre even responded to that and said, well, but your mind is still your own. Well, I'm not even sure that that's true. We have mind-altering drugs or, you know... Uh, I, I don't think the perspective of absolute radical existential freedom is a realistic one. Um, and I think it's socially irresponsible, to be honest, um, to think that everybody has equal opportunity um, to do whatever they choose in their lives. I think this, this readily elides into a very right-wing conservative perspective, which certainly John Paul Sartre and his allies were not, that says... Everyone has an equal opportunity. We're all free. And those of us who are doing well and are multimillionaires, um, we deserve it because of our wonderful choices. Well, in fact, in most cases, they were born with a, a silver spoon in their mouth. Or as someone said about George Bush, you know, he was he was born on third base and he, he, he thought he had hit, hit a triple. Um, you know, <laughs> that's not the way the world works for most of us. Um, and so I think it's not only inaccurate, but genuinely unfair to assume that everyone has equal freedom. Um, so once again, I think when it comes to existentialism, Buddhism, to some extent even biology, at least some of the more extreme claims of biology, um, I think we need to avoid fundamentalisms. Um, well, really hard. I like to think in terms of yes, no, right, wrong, black, white, but there are lots more shades of gray. We'd better get used to it. Well, speaking of one of those black and white apps fundamentalist things, um, there is a strand in biology, or at least in some of the sort of the hard sciences, that is um, sort of disavowing the idea of fr free will. Just that it's a um, intellectually incoherent um, tenant given uh, what we what 
we think we know about sort of the neuroanatomy of the brain. Um, I'd be curious to hear your thoughts on a biological view of free will and um, does it, how, what, what degree is it relevant to this um, trifecta or the, this yeah. intersection with existentialism and Buddhism? Well, I think once again, it is relevant. And once again, it represents one of those cases where to push the argument too far becomes, in fact, incoherent. Um, I think there's something incoherent about free will, and I'm not alone in that. Um, if you look at the basic, what we know about neuro, in fact, everything we know about neurobiology, um, one is forced to the conclusion, I, I believe, and I'm, I'm, I know I'm not alone in this, that free will is an impossibility. That if, I, if everything we perceive, um, our consciousness, our, uh, our decisions to do things, um, is a function of the, of the actions of our neurons, which involves the passage of charged ions across cell membranes, in response to pre-existing situations, uh, osmotic potentials, electrical potentials, all sorts of other things, then where is the freedom? Where is the little homunculus residing somehow inside our brain, independent of external material forces, that is anything analogous to free will? And so I think if you push that argument, if you really look hard at what, everything we know about neurobiology, I think you're, one is forced to the conclusion that free will is a logical impossibility. And yet, I think we all know, I certainly feel that I have free will. I'm sure you do too, Josh, and I suspect everyone watching and listening to this is similarly misinformed. <laughs> and yet, when you have such a widespread, deep belief at some level, I think we have no choice but to act as though we have free will. Um, or, or is it, so, or is it, so we, is it that there isn't a an absolute free will or something that's independent of biology, but that the, the material uh, hardware of the brain generates a phenomenon that, in some ways, can act upon the hardware at a certain point. So like there's, 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 there is this phenomenon of, of consciousness and choice that we experience subjectively that seems to f and feels like it's able to exert influence. Like, like I think you, use, you even use the phrase that our genes you know, whisper, but they don't bark, shout orders. And yeah. in, in the same way, is, is it that, that our brains are kind of wired to, to nudge us in certain directions, but it's not deterministic to, in an absolute sense? Well, I think it's not deterministic if you look at our genes, because there are so many factors that intervene between DNA and actual behavior. I mean, just as there are factors that intervene between DNA and the, the sh 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 shape and structure of our kidneys or something. I mean, nothing is, there's not a direct one-to-one -one correspondence um, with regard to, say, genes. When it comes to our neurology, and our nerve cells and our consciousness, um, I at least don't see a co intellectually coherent intermediate position here. Um, uh, maybe there is one, yeah. but I don't. I don't perceive it. And I, I, I'd go further and say, for what it's worth, I think the biggest unanswered question. I, I was, was giving a lecture not too long ago and was asked. What is the biggest uh, biggest mystery in biology these days? Um, and my initial response, and the more I think about it, still my, would be my response, is that it is, in fact, bridging that gap, what has been called the, the hard problem of consciousness, bridging that gap between the material and the subjective. Um, we, know, we know a huge amount about neurobiology, but we still don't seem to really be close to that. But I don't see an intermediate position that is intellectually coherent. Mm -hmm. And so as a scientist, um, I find myself uh, somewhat hypocritical, to be honest, because I don't think free will can be defined, can be defended as a reality. And yet I certainly behave as though I have it. And I expect everyone else around me <laughs> to do the same thing. Right. So then, so then is the... <laughs> To plug it back into the Buddhist existential piece, yeah. Yeah. Um, if there is no free will, then the 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 act of choosing is just a, a misinformed um, kind of self delusion. I think so. 
That's right. But we all do well to act as a function of that self-delusion. So it would be an exact, looking, looking at that interesting trifecta, um, this is a situation, with regard to free will, we have a situation in which I think um, the existentialists um, and the Buddhists are in bed together, if you will, uh, and the biologists are kind of outside of it. That is to say, existentialists and the Buddhists both believe in a substantial degree of free will as a real thing, whereas biologists, by and large, uh, have a hard time accepting it, and I think for good reason. So there are various areas where if you take the three, I think they, they cohere in many ways, but there are some really intriguing areas in which each one can be outside, mm -hmm. um, especially if you push any one argument, too, I was going to say very far or too far, <laughs> depending on how you look at right. it. I was wondering if if you could use the myth of Sisyphus. I know Camus wrote about this, but if you could use the myth of Sisyphus as a way of um, maybe grounding what what this what this orientation to life might provide, or, sure. Like because this, this is more like the like the prescriptive side of it, where um, you've got Sisyphus condemned to hell, pushing a big boulder up a hill only to watch it roll down again, and he has to repeat this ad infinitum forever and ever. Um, what, is, what, is, uh, what is the classic existential interpretation of that, and then what would be an existential Buddhist biological interpretation of that? <laughs> okay. Well, now that's a mouthful. Um, the, the, the essay that Camus wrote is only about three or four pages long called The Myth of Sisyphus, in which he... He um, reimagined, well, he didn't really reimagine what Sisyphus was doing, but he reimagined what was going on within his head. Rather than seeing Sisyphus as a, um, someone in torment, Camus suggested, more than suggested, claimed very strongly, that what he was doing, he, Sisyphus was doing, was acting out the role of the true existential hero because he was engaging in this act fully knowing that it would fail fully knowing that every time he pushed that rock up the hill, it was going to roll back down again. If he thought that this each time, if he thought, well, maybe this time it's going to do it, this time it's going to stay, then he wouldn't be an absurd hero. He'd be a ridiculous hero. Okay. Mm -hmm. What makes him a hero in the absurd sense is there is something absurd about what he is doing, what Sisyphus is doing, and yet he persists in doing it anyhow, fully knowing he's going to fail. And in that sense, the, the analog here, although Camus didn't draw it directly, is in our own lives. We are like Sisyphus. We are Sisyphus in that our rock is always ultimately going to roll downhill. And not only with regard to specific little plans, but ultimately we're all going to die. And by virtue of that fact, and one can argue anything and everything we do is absurd. And so why bother doing anything? Well, for Camus and many of the, exist in fact, the existentialists generally, it doesn't matter what's going to happen eventually. What is important is you define yourself by what you do, how you behave. Here's your rock. Your job is to push it up the hill regardless. Um, now, that would be, a, again, that's very much the existentialist view. Um, the, the biological view is not that different from that, that there is something absurd about living one's life simply to promote one's genes, and there are many people who really like not to do so. Um, and even those who do, they're going to die eventually anyhow. Um, so their genes are going to go on, but that's not going to do them any good. So in that sense, we're absurd heroes just by living our lives and doing the best we can. Um, now, to introduce the B Buddhist perspective here um, is more complicated. Um, Camus writes in his lovely little essay, which I strongly recommend to everybody, uh, he talks about, <laughs> he uses a phrase that, that seems quaintly modern. He says, the rock is his thing. Yeah, yeah, which, yeah. I, know I read it this morning, so yeah, I'm, a little, I'm familiar with it now. It, it, it's kind of an odd, it reads, at least it's almost too modern now. It's like a, but, it's like a beat poet, like the rock was his thing. <laughs> that's <my> thing, <laughs> yeah. But, but I think from the Buddhist perspective, what one can take from this is that, again, the argument of interpenetration and interbeing, that Sisyphus and his rock 
and his mountain and his toil is are all those things are interpenetrating in in indistinguishable in a, in, a, in a literal sense and so what sisyphus is doing is not so much something that he's condemned to do any more than we are condemned to breathe or condemned for our hearts to be that it's part of the natural course of what it means to be alive and even more than that what it means to be a material being in a essential in, in a material world mm-hmm. and that by by virtue of our functioning um we are behaving in concert with the universe whether we know it or not um better yet to know it better to be mindful and know what you're doing but either way that's what's happening well that piece comes up i think in the essay where when the rock rolls down you know sisyphus gets it up the hill and then it rolls down and it's in that window of time where the rock is rolling down that I think Camus implies that that Sisyphus is now conscious right. of what's happening. And it's sort of that that self-consciousness that he comes to that is somehow, I don't know if I bought it, but it was somehow, that, that that's what made the experience transformed or transformed yeah. the experience from, from drudgery to something that was producing joy and happiness. Absolutely. I think you read it. You read it as I do, for sure. And again, he comes to this rather stunning conclusion. He, Camus, and maybe this is too, at the very end of his essay, Camus writes, one must imagine Sisyphus happy. Right. And the Buddhist joy is there. Um, the existentialist satisfaction in a life well lived is there as well. So I get so the, so one way I've I've heard this re- interpreted by a Buddhist teacher that sort of um, that Sisyphus is he's sort of condemned it's a it's a it's a form of torture if he is like resisting the experience with um, views and the thoughts that are that are desiring something else so if his mind is you know in the, in the kind of a Zen sense if his mind is tormented by um, thoughts of wanting it to stop or wanting to be over with it, then that's what's going to create this the, the, the suffering overlay on top of the experience. But if he's just with the, the bareness of the experience, his mind uh, is, in a sense, inoculated to that secondary uh, torment. Um, I'm very glad you raised that because, again, just the uh, important part of Buddhist thought is the benefit of releasing craving. And if Sisyphus was, while he was doing this hard work, you picture him sweating and his muscles straining, but if he was also craving to get it over with so that he wouldn't ever have to do it again, um, that would be the exact kind of craving that the Buddhists urge us to um, avoid, if at all possible, to overcome. And the notion would be, that Sisyphus is not captured by that degree of craving. Now, I don't, you don't find this in mythology <laughs> right. explicitly stated. This is something we're overlaying on it. Yeah, but there seems to be a way that like, the existentialist view could be one that um, leads to a kind of passivity or just sort of accept, like a, an excuse for an acceptance or an apology for kind of things that are unjust um, and, and not resisting them. Like, well, this is, this is your boulder, you just have to push it kind of thing. Um, and so... And the existentialist perspective, I think it's more at risk in the, some interpretations of the Buddhist perspective, which one is supposed to be, at least according to the, those who follow that perspective, you're supposed to be um, concerned only with your own internal um, spiritual life and unconcerned with the external world. But for the existentialist they were profoundly concerned with what to do, how to deal with the external world. I mean, particularly the more modern version of uh, existentialism out of France was really created in the in the cauldron of, of World War II during the, the Nazi occupation of, of, of France, yeah. where you, you had to choose. And this is a big part of that Camusian, Sartrean philosophy. Uh, you know, you can look at it in terms of um, uh, Eldridge Cleaver's more recent statement, not that recent now, but it was in the 1970s, early 70s, you know, uh, um, 
to, to not to choose is to choose. Um, and so you can't avoid that. You can't avoid choosing. And that's a very existential perspective. Okay. Maybe I just mis mis misinterpreting the, the, the sense of, uh, sort of capitulating to the, to the boulder. <laughs> That, yeah, I don't think that's something that the existentialist would buy. Quite uh -huh. the opposite. That the whole purpose of life is to define yourself by what are you going to do? Here's this boulder. What are you going to do about it? Mm -hmm. you know, are you going to let it roll over on you? Are you going to work against it? Are you going to mislead yourself <laughs> in thinking you're going to be successful? Um, and the ideal heroic stance, at least for the existentialist, is knowing you're not going to be successful – but doing it anyhow, because that's what it means to be human. And for myself, I would add, um, I've been a, a environmentalist, uh, human rights activist, and particularly anti-nuclear campaigner for a very long time. Do I think we're going to get rid of nuclear weapons? I would love it if we did. Can we put the genie back in the bottle? Maybe, but I don't. I, frankly, I'm not at all sure. Um, I'm not. I'm not optimistic. But I also feel that I have an obligation, a bit like Sisyphus, to try to, to keep pushing that rock up the hill so that I'll at least have done my part to try to make it less likely that we'll blow up the world. Um, mm -hmm. Knowing full well that I may fail, um, I feel like that's a moral obligation and one can ex ex extend that um, and should extend that to things like – global warming or uh, issues of social justice any number of things where are we really going to succeed i don't know what does success mean i think for a human being success means choosing your path feeling that it is the right path and then doing it with all your heart and and so then one argument might come come up or one qu question around well how does how does that not necessarily lead to kind of a, a a dead end of kind of solipsistic narcissistic? Well, I'm gonna I'm gonna do my way and and screw you because who are you to tell me I can't do it my way? Well, that's again you you ask a really good question, Josh. I have to say this is a profound issue and it's been a profound issue for the existentialists and for those of us who who read that that material and for the Buddhist too, because you can go in that direction. Right. Um, and many Buddhists have been legitimately accused of isolating themselves from the world to a degree that's um, certainly troublesome for the rest of the world, perhaps, in that it deprives the world of, of their efforts. Um, I mean, one, one issue then that arises, okay, let's say you're free to choose. Let's assume that you really are free. Let's assume that free will really, really, really exists. Um, that doesn't necessarily tell you anything about what you should do, how you should choose. And yet, um, I'm quite sure the existentialists during the Nazi occupation of France would not argue that it's equally acceptable to collaborate with the Nazis as it would be to oppose them. And yet, if one does it out of one's own free will, what is the basis for saying you shouldn't do that? Um, and this is a case where the existentialists Sartre in particular sort of tied himself up into knots and wound up saying, if you are a belief, essentially, I'm paraphrasing, obviously, but if you believe that for free will, freedom is important, then of necessity, you ought to behave in a manner that maximizes the freedom of others. Mm. Well, I like that, except once you buy into that, you're restricting your own freedom. And if freedom is really this ultimate goal, then you've got a problem. And I think part of the answer is that freedom itself is not the ultimate goal. That freedom is really a route to something else. Um, do, you exactly to, do you want to fill in that business? sentence? Oh. <laughs> I'm sorry, did you answer it? I said it. Uh, I said <laughs> exactly what that something else is. I don't know. Um, hmm. Well, I was going to end by asking you what is, and you sort of already answered this with your own biography sketch a little bit, but um, what does a practicing existential bio-Buddhist look like? <laughs> yeah. I, I don't know. I think you may be looking at the only one in the world. <laughs> well, yeah, no, I was going to ask, are there, are there people that you think do infuse these elements in, their, in, their, in, the, in the way they are? Or 
and or if there aren't examples, um, what would a practice of being existential by a Buddhist look like? Like, you know, I can, I can tell you what a, maybe a practice, a practice of being a Buddhist might look like, but... Or a biologist or an existentialist. Right. But yeah, I, certainly I don't know of any individuals that I can point to who mindfully, intentionally attempt to combine all three of these. Um, I do. Um, mm -hmm. I think what it reflects is that what it what it what it um, what's involved in that case, in my case at least, is a maximum awareness of what's going on inside myself. What are some of the factors that influence my choices um, and my preferences? And that's a primarily biological thing, if you will, biological some degree of biological insight. If you will, I mean no, biological you know, in, insight into impulses and, and yeah, what my genes are up to, yeah, essentially, and then a degree of self knowledge, if possible, insofar as one is capable of it, um, that comes from sort of insightful meditation, insofar as one can engage in that, um, and recognizing that that self knowledge at the same time is suffused with a connectedness and a degree of error by definition because the self as such is um, a misleading construct in many ways and so there's there are tricky balancing acts here if you once you add the the buddhistic perspective which it, to some extent helps me keep take myself a little less seriously than i might otherwise um, and, and then the, at least as an independent entity, and also speaks to my mind, speaks to a degree of responsibility. And the existentialist perspective then adds to that a sense of um, permission, essentially, to go ahead and choose those paths that feel right to me. Hmm. But again, I, I can only speak for my, quote, self. Sure, sure. No, no, no. I know, I know it's a very personal um, yeah. thing you put, c come up with. Um, but, uh, yeah, I, I do think it I, – I do like the way that they do they, – they inform, they amplify certain aspects of each other, they constrain aspects of each other, and I think it's a compelling, uh, con tr compelling trifecta. Well, thank you. <laughs> they, I think they also, just to be honest and fair, they also help – illuminate some of the weaknesses in each of the three right you know and I, I know we're coming to the end here um, so I'm gonna be respectful of your time but one of the things around you know, just the Buddha's own life story is that and I know you know this and for any of the listeners that aren't aware of this that up until the age of about 29 he was he lived kind of a protected uh, life in a royal family in I think in Nepal and um, or present-day Nepal and it was only when he got to 29 that he actually escaped the palace grounds uh, and, and confronted an aging man, a dying man, uh, or a sick man, a dying man, and, and, a, and a corpse, as well as a wandering mendicant. Um, and it, I mean, this is the myth, or this is the story we've inherited. But you could say that this is a, this is a what's, what's that? I'm, I was going to say it caused his enlightenment, it didn't it? Caused his his dissatisfaction with the artificial life he had been leading. Right, right. and it. Um, is there something you, a beeping on your end? Yeah. Well, anyway, maybe they can edit that out. Um, yeah. Well, it was it was it was through the I mean, <clears throat> kind of this existential confrontation with death mm -hmm. that sort of disrupted his life to, to such a degree that he needed to go find that which was not subject to aging, illness, and death. And that has been interpreted and presented as kind of seeking some sort of met metaphysical escape hatch. But I wonder, and my, my inclination is that he, he came to a resolution of that ontological truth or ontological ent entity that he would die. That, that 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 was his awakening. He was able to, uh, in a kind of an existential sense, wake up out of the conditioning, his biological conditioning, wake up out of um, sort of his cultural conditioning, and in a way live an authentic, uh, 
life of freedom from conditioning. Sometimes, you know, the, the Buddhist conception of freedom is that it's a freedom that's sort of transcendent or not of this world. Uh, right. right. But right. but it could be just a, a, a freedom from conditioning, certain kinds of conditioning. That's certainly a, a very interesting way to look at it, and, and I think it can be it can be readily defended. Um, he, I don't know to what extent he. This one art would I would argue that he specifically found freedom from death itself any more than he found no i don't think he found i think death was sort of i don't think yeah i, I agree i don't think he found he, obviously he died but right. <laughs> age of 80 supposedly so, yeah. but um there is this curious phrase that like mindfulness is the path to the deathless and mm-hmm. mindlessness is the is a path to death right right uh you see those phrases in, in the in the uh, dhammapada um <clears throat> And it, it just, I, I don't know, it, to me, particularly considering what you had written about the existentialists, that it struck me as that they might agree with that, that if you're not conscious, yeah. it's as though you're dead already. You know, what that reminds me of, Josh, is one of the uh, lovely phrases uh, from Kierkegaard, where he wrote about a man who, was, who lived his life so um, unselfconscious or unconsciously unaware that he was in fact experiencing what he was um that uh he wasn't even aware he was alive until one day he woke up and found himself dead <laughs> I, i'm I, yeah i think you, you had that in the book i'm not sure how the... <laughs> I think I did too. <laughs> how, do you, how do you find yourself dead <laughs> well right right you've got to pass on in other words you can live your life without realizing without appreciating the moment yeah without realizing that you are alive and experiencing and enjoying it insofar as one can, without a, a uh, mindful awareness of what's going on. And if you live your life essentially sleepwalking, one day you'll be dead and you will never really have lived, mm-hmm. at least not subjectively. <laughs> right, right. Well, that might be a good place to end or pause for now. Um, I want to thank you again for your time. It was great talking to you. And I, I think I did extract a commitment from you to come back and talk about your more recent book, Out of Eden. Yeah, sure, sure. I'm happy to do that. Okay, that'd be great. Yeah. I actually have another one that I'm just finishing up now. I, you know, ever since one consequence of um, graduating from UW, if anything, I have seemed to have more time for writing and stuff than I did. So I have another book that I'm just finishing up now. That has a great title. The best thing about it is the title from there on. It's sort of downhill called uh, P- Paradigms Lost. <laughs> and eventually, you know, it won't come out for a year, year and a half from now. But we could talk about that, too. Someday. Sure. We'll have to have a conversation. Is, and is that about uh, sort of a museum of, of dead paradigms? Yeah. Well, to some extent, yes. It's about human misconceptions that we are in the process of outgrowing, essentially. Mm. Um, I mean, some of them, the obvious ones, like uh, the uh, the geocentric universe. Right, right. You know, special creation. A lot of them related to notions of human centrality, that we are somehow central, fundamental to the cosmos in, in one way or another. And that's all bullshit. <laughs> We're not nearly as important as we like to think we are. <laughs> I buy that. All right, well, I look forward to those conversations. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so, so Josh, one other thing. If you would like to get a hold of um, Out of Eden, um, if you want, I can give you the... I'll, I'll email you the... Uh, I have a copy. Oh, you do already? I already have a copy. All okay. right, we'll, we'll be in touch when, when, whenever it seems to work. Hang on one sec. Let me just...